Now, as we discussed in the previous lecture on maximum likelihood, in order to compute the likelihood of a single column in an alignment of sequences, you have to compute the likelihood for all the possible combinations of ancestral nucleotides in the tree. So you don't know what the ancestral nucleosides were, of course. In the simple case here, where we have four sequences, we will have two ancestral nucleotides, and there will therefore be 16 possible combinations of ancestral nucleotides at the two internal nodes. We can have ANA, ANC, ANG, etc., up to TNT at these two internal uh, ancestral nodes. For each of these possibilities, we use the recipe I gave you on the previous slide to compute the likelihood for the current set of parameter values. As it turns out, this can actually be used to start thinking about what those ancestral sequences were like. You'll notice that for any given pair of ancestral nucleotides here, we have a probability, we have a likelihood. This is actually a quantification of how probable that particular pair of ancestral nucleotides were. So if you compare the numbers here, you can see that it's much less likely that the two ancestral nucleotides were A and T than that they were, for instance, T and G. It's much, much, much more likely that this were the two ancestral nucleotides. These numbers can therefore be used to choose what you think the ancestral sequence has looked like. Remember, this is one column in the alignment. We're doing this one precision in the sequence at a time. So how would you think about what the ancestral sequence was for this particular position? Well, first of all, you wouldn't actually do it for two ancestral, nucle for two ancestral uh, sequences at a time. Typically, if you're trying to reconstruct an ancestral sequence, you will be interesting, interested in just the sequence at one ancestral node. For instance, the ancestor of all mammals or the ancestor of all vertebrates or whatever uh, group of animals you're looking at. So to do that, you will focus on one of the ancestral nodes. The way you do that is you'll see that, for instance, the bottom four here, they all have T at node one. These all have G at node one, etc. So to reconstruct the ancestor, the most likely ancestor at node one, you would take all the uh, the four combinations which have, for instance, T at that ancestral node and add up their likelihoods. This will result in a table like this. Here's an example where I've put in some actual numbers and, and done the computations. If you now compare these numbers, you can see that there are some nucleotides that are much more likely to have been present at the ancestral node one than others. And in particular, in this case, by far the most likely ancestor at node one is a T. That, of course, fits very nicely with the fact that its two descendants are both T. But there, here we actually have a number that tells us how much better this ancestral reconstruction is than any other ancestral reconstruction. You can see that it's more, about 100 times more probable than, than having either a G or a C, and several thousand times, tens of thousand times more likely than having had an A at this particular position. So doing this type of thing, it's possible actually to, for any given ancestral node in a phylogenetic tree, to go through it position by position, and for each position, give us the probability distribution over the possible nucleotides here, and even picking the most likely nucleotide at, at each position. Doing that, it's actually possible to reconstruct entire ancestral sequences. For instance, how did this particular protein look, or how did this particular enzyme look in the ancestor of all vertebrates, or in the ancestor of all uh, proteogamma bacteria, or whatever group you're looking at. And people have been doing that, and they haven't just been doing it uh, in silico, they haven't just done this on the sequence level. Some people have actually gone to the, uh, uh, gone ahead and reconstructed, synthesized the corresponding proteins in the lab. First you reconstruct the sequence, DNA sequence, from that you can then express the corresponding protein, which you can then uh, uh, purify in the lab until you have in your, uh, in your Ebendorf tube some of that particular protein, and you can now do experiments on a protein that uh, with some probability corresponded to a protein that existed maybe millions or even billions of years ago. People have done that, as I say, for a number of different proteins. I've just listed a few of the different enzyme and protein types that they've done it for here, ribonucleases, chymase proteases, PAX transcription factors, 
vertebrate rhodopsins, steroid receptors, and the elongation factor EFTU. The age of these reconstructed ancestors ranges from millions of years to actually billions of years, several billions uh, of years. One fun example, just mentioning this, was the vertebrate rhodopsins. In one example, a group reconstructed the rhodopsin, that's a protein that's uh, responsible for transforming light into energy and for detecting light in, in the eyes. One group reconstructed a rhodopsin that corresponded to an ancestral protein that would have been present in a particular group of dinosaurs. What they got was a functional, it turned out, rhodopsin. It could, uh, it could take light and, and function in the, in the manner that, uh, that rhodopsins typically work, namely by activating a G protein transducer and, uh, and, 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 and working exactly like rhodopsin uh, would today. Moreover, it would do that in a manner where it was able to, it was quite sensitive, it could uh, detect very low levels of light, indicating or suggesting at least that perhaps this particular dinosaur had been night active, that it could actually see quite well at night. Of course, there's a degree of uncertainty here, but it's an uncertainty that we have at least starting to quantify with these probabilities. And you can see how one can make uh, tremendously uh, fun and interesting science by, by reconstructing proteins like that and starting thinking about these things. I've given a, a reference down here if you want to, to have a closer look at, at this particular example. Another fun example of ancestral reconstruction is the reconstruction of certain uh, elongation factors. Again, done for a range of, in this case, a range of ancestors corresponding to different uh, time points uh, going back to the uh, common ancestor here. From each of this uh, a large range of ancestral uh, sequences, they reconstructed the elongation factor, expressed it, purified it, and then had it in the lab, and then went ahead and did various measurements, including, for instance, the melting temperature, the temperature at which the protein unfolds. Uh, I've indicated that schematically on this slide, and I've given you a, a reference here if you want to, to have a closer look at that. Now, the really interesting thing about that was that if you took the uh, measured melting temperatures of these reconstructed ancestral proteins. You would take each of them, measure its melting temperature. For each protein, you also approximately knew from various geological uh, methods how long ago that particular ancestor lived. And if you now plot the melting temperatures of these different proteins uh, as a function of time, we have the x-axis, it's sort of reversed here, it's going backwards in time here, so this is the present, this is 4 billion years ago, you could see that the longer ago uh, the protein existed, the higher its melting temperature. Very interestingly, if you take this curve and compare it to a curve of inferred oceanic, uh, oceanic temperatures in those same ages, you can do that based on, on various uh, physical uh, methods having to do with isotopes, etc. And I've indicated it with this uh, dotted gray line in the background here, there's a tremendously good correlation between the measured melting temperatures of proteins and the inferred oceanic temperatures at those different time points. So we are, it seems here, actually resurrecting proteins that have properties that correspond to the physical reality at that time, billions of years ago. Tremendously interesting, really, really nice uh, work here. Final example of ancestral reconstruction, uh, I'm just mentioning this more uh, as a fun uh, thing. It turns out that handwritten manuscripts, manuscripts uh, uh, constructed before Gutenberg invented the printing press, can actually be analyzed with many of the same methods that we use for phylogenetic uh, reconstruction. The whole process by which manuscripts were copied, where a monk, for instance, at a convent would hand copy, starting with an original and then make a copy, and then maybe other monks would copy from his copy or from the original or from the copies of the copies. This whole process is genealogical. It very much resembles the process of DNA replication. You have errors that are introduced along the way. <coughs> Later copies inherit earlier errors, etc. Therefore, you can actually use phylogenetic methods to reconstruct trees of, of manuscripts and in those trees, you will find that clusters of manuscripts correspond to manuscripts typically that have been created uh, from a single original, from maybe in a single convent, you will have a cluster here. 
However, you can also use, and that, uh, that's why I'm mentioning it here, you can actually also use these ancestral reconstruction techniques to start thinking about what the original manuscript looked like. So using ancestral reconstruction from all the existing copies, you can start thinking, okay, when did this character actually join up with the other pilgrims, if you're talking about Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, for instance, or uh, what was the original word used by this Icelandic hero, things like that. I've given you again just a few examples here of, of how these methods can be used, uh, phylogenetic methods can be used on, on manuscripts. Really a fun example of this also.